Yesterday, we talked a lot about UFUNCs and trying to make NumPy fast by using UFUNCs. So by taking advantage of those routines that basically run a machine code. And we already introduced you, if not in detail, to number vectorize. So this notebook goes into a little more detail on how to use number vectorize. So what happens when we take a simple trig function um, from the math library and maybe have a function that um, we also want to apply that doesn't exist yet, like sine A cosine B. Could also be sine A cosine A or maybe sine squared A plus um, cosine squared A. Yeah, good. Actually, most compilers don't get it yet. I mean, compilers do wonderful optimizations and um, will break down entire series to um, the closed expression, but they don't do sine squared plus cosine squared yet. Anyway, um, so we have this function here, and it takes two variables, a and b, and calculates the sine times the cosine. All right, what happens if we do this with a NumPy array, if we pass a NumPy array to this routine. Any guesses? What will happen? Hmm? Not work. Oh, won't work. Yes, exactly. Um, let's try. There we go. Only size one arrays, so actually you can pass a NumPy array as long as it's of size one, um, can be converted to Python scalars. Because I explicitly actually use the math sign here and the math cosine, not the NumPy versions. If I had used the NumPy versions, it would have worked, would have been boring, and I wouldn't have had anything to show. But with this, um, it doesn't. All right, so what can we do? We can use, hmm? we could compile. Yep, so we can use NumPy vectorize like we learned yesterday. Um, and we do that. Hello? Ah, there we go. Timing took some time. Um, and we do that and we see it takes 436 milliseconds for the array that I just set up in the previous section. It's working though. I can also use number vectorize. And here I basically use the same interface as for the NumPy version, so I use it as a function call. And I get 7.09 milliseconds. That is a speed up of about, what was it, 60? Not bad. Now, when we do that, um, it actually compiles it whenever I call it. So when I um, create this function like that, it actually only basically creates a call-in. It doesn't compile at that time. It will actually wait for the function to be called before it compiles it. Then it looks at the arguments that I'm passing, and it will create machine code for that function with the arguments it was called with. This is somewhat similar to C++'s template mechanism. But sometimes I don't want this to happen just at the time when I call it. I want it to happen when I define these functions and then I want to be done with it. And that's where eager compilation comes in. I can tell number which versions I want by passing a, um, a list of strings where I'm um, giving first the return argument, in this case 
uh, double precision floating point number, which of course has eight bytes, not four, um, and two integers here. So this would be the same as saying in 64. In this notation, this is bytes. Okay, so I create one version for um, F8, I8, I8. I create a second version for um, single precision floating point numbers and a third version for double precision floating point numbers. I said no Python equal true, which means it can't do calls into um, the Python runtime. Why would I use this? One advantage is that I can also give it a target keyword. So the, the types would, it would try to detect automatically. Although if it finds something that is compatible, for example, if I pass floating point numbers and I already had a double precision version, it would just use the double precision version. Wouldn't care. Um, but other than that, I would just be fine calling it at my function call. The overhead, yeah, it's there, but first of all, it's only there the first time when I call it, and if I have a simulation that runs often, then, well, I shouldn't profile that first call, maybe, but other than that, it doesn't do much bad. But this is a real advantage here. If I use eager compilation, so I specify the type, I can give the target. The default target is CPU, which just means we do the same thing as before, single-threaded. But there's also target parallel. And now here it becomes interesting because I'm now saying apply the same operation to a long vector of numbers. It can take this operation, break it up, and run it over multiple threads. Another interesting target is CUDA. Pitstein gets most of its compute powers out of the GPUs. With this, you can actually have your UFUNCs use the GPU. And we'll go into this in more detail when we talk about um, CUDA for Python. So here would be a complete um, signature. Notice that it basically has two sets of parentheses. One for specifying the arguments. So here my list of um, function signatures, my no Python equal true, and my target parallel. That is, these are arguments to number vectorize, and then the actual function. So if I do the parallel sine cosine, it takes 6.52 milliseconds. Um, that's not much improvement. I'm now running this on 12 cores rather than one, and I got a speed up of, what, 10%? That's simply because that array was kind of small before, and you have to push kind of hard to get to better numbers. So if it gets large enough, it will actually work even better if it has work to do. Um, so that the threads actually have some work within the thread that they need to do. But here the improvement is a little better. Some of you have done this exercise already with the number vectorized, but this time you are supposed to. So we use the same escape time algorithm, but this time you should use the um, number vectorize, either as decorator or as a function, to um, do a vectorized version, so a ufunc of the Mandelbrot. This is a ufunc because we are giving, a, the input value is of the same shape as the output value, so it's a regular ufunc. Once you're done with that, please visualize so that you know that you did it right. <laughs> 